SMS. So uh, we, we talked last time about uh, the fact that this class, the essence of this class is really to cover uh, finite element models applied to flow, mass transport, heat transport, all of which are scalar quantities, and to mechanics, solid mechanics, and fluid mechanics, Navier-Stokes type equations, but mainly solid mechanics, which are vector quantities, and then to start combining them in, in some way. We talked also about the fact that finite element models transcended whether you're dealing with a one-dimensional or a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional problem. The same code will solve problems in all three of those uh, domains. And also the same code will solve solid mechanics problems and flow problems and Navier-Stokes problems and electromagnetic problems uh, as well. And so the essence of um, finite element analysis is that you end up solving a system of equations, whoops, I guess, a blunt instrument, I think I can do it smoothly, see this better, uh, something, well it's not much better, some matrix equation such as this, a vector, a vector, and uh, an n by n matrix. And uh, for the problems that we'll deal with, this matrix for steady state problems uh, we'll call uh, either a conductance matrix for flow problems or from where the method has its origins, it was developed out of structural mechanics and the matrix that links displacements and forces uh, is typically referred to as a stiffness matrix. So for solid mechanics problems, uh, the appropriate matrices or matrix comprised of many sub-matrices that links forces applied at nodes to displacements realized at nodes is a, a stiffness matrix. So this is this. And it's this K, K matrix, or was this term. And this is probably something that's a, a little bit premature, but to make the point, or, or to drive the point home, that when you're dealing with solid mechanics problems, um, or flow problems, that they can all be solved by the same um, finite element code, then it's the form of this matrix is the only real thing that changes between those different um, implementations. And so, although in this class we'll talk mainly about introducing finite element models in a physical sense of, of how things interact with each other rather than a mathematical sense where we talk about PDEs, it's perhaps worthwhile noting that if you're dealing with uh, fluid flow problems, where, for instance, um, you're dealing with something, if you're familiar with groundwater flow equations, where you're dealing with something that, for instance, looks like uh, second order partial of pressure. I'm going to have to change this. Uh, it's a bit too blunt for me. With respect to x squared plus d2p dy squared equals uh, specific storage. Maybe this is multiplied by permeability and viscosity as material properties. Um, let's do it, uh, won't be in terms of storage, but it'd be in terms of compressibility and a change in pressure as a function of time. So if, for instance, we were trying to solve things in terms of uh, PDEs, then uh, the final element equations would have to accommodate these PDEs. And so it turns out that if you're looking at this second order partial differential equation in space, which is, you know, this, which would be displacement or pressure or whatever the variable was, then the form of this, if you look at it in a finite element format, comprises these uh, three, two matrices. One is, uh, would be a constitutive matrix, 
bad writing, but you can get that. Constitutive matrix. And so for solid mechanics problems, this would be Hooke's law, elasticity matrix. For flow problems, this would be Darcy's law. For contaminant transport problems, this would be Fick's law of diffusion. And for heat transfer problems, this would be Fourier's law. Uh, and so you know, probably, that related to that, that all of those relate, for instance, a, a velocity of flow of something, or a flux, to, this is Darcy's law, TPDX. So the constitutive law, which embodies this, relates a gradient of a quantity to an outcome. Gradient of pressure gives you a fluid flux. A gradient of displacement gives you a force through elasticity matrix. A gradient of temperature gives you a heat flux through thermal conductivity, etc. So constituent matrix matrices always relate a gradient of something, displacement, pressure, temperature, to an outcome, a flux or a force. And so this is defined by the particular problem at hand. The other matrix uh, is something that depends on two things. It depends on the, uh, the type of element, so whether it's a triangular element or whether it's a prismatic element. It depends. You'd get a different A matrix based on these. And it also depends on um, the shape functions that you apply for the over the element to map the functions. So again, that's something beyond where we are now. But the, the point I think I want to make uh, in this is that because we're able to solve many different kinds of problems with the same code, everything is done in this stiffness matrix or conductance matrix. And this differs really only depending on the problem that you're solving. If you're solving a problem that is really can be thought of as a second order PDE, then the conductance matrix, stiffness matrix, will always look like this. And so if we know what the constitutive matrix is and we know what the shape of the elements are, we have everything defined. If we're solving a problem that instead of just being fluid flow is something that is related to, for instance, contaminant transport. Uh, so a typical PDE that represents contaminant transport in porous media or anything else would include a diffusion term, which is exactly the same as this, and is exactly the same as this, uh, minus a advective term. A change in concentration with location and multiplied by a fluid velocity. So in other words, the analogy I always use is you take a beaker and you put fill it with water, put a drop of ink in it. With time, the ink spreads out within the water and it becomes cloudy, uh, and that's diffusion. If you take that beaker and you walk across the room with it, then you're advecting it because the water is moving with it. The term that represents that is this advective term here, and it would relate to something like uh, dcdt on the right-hand side, maybe with a, a retardation coefficient in it. doesn't matter what that is yet. But this is a first-order PDE, dcdx, and so to any PDE that looks like this has a slightly different um, form to it. It has the velocity at which flow occurs, which is the same velocity as we talked about here. It has the same A matrix, which we say is, has something to do with the shape of the elements. And this term here is actually just a, a shape function which allows us to map components from the nodes across the element. It doesn't matter what it is right now. And so any PDE that looks like this will end up having these component elements components in it. And so long as we can figure out exactly for each element what the A matrix looks like and the B matrix looks like, actually A is just the derivative of B as it turns out, um, then we can put it together. And so finally, second order with respect to space dimension, first order with respect to space dimension, zeroth order with respect to space dimension. So in here, this would actually be a good indicator of this, right? This capacitance term, if you like, change in concentration with time, change in head with time, 
in the groundwater flow equation. All that matters is it's something that's changing with time. No space dimension in there whatsoever. So you could think of it, as I mentioned before, in this um, sequence, second order in space, first order in space, zeroth order in space, because it doesn't vary in space. And in that case, the capacitance matrix, as perhaps we'll call it, always has the components that look like this. Well, actually, that look like this. Oops. This is this capacitance matrix. And so if we know what those are, then we can solve all these different problems. So really, it's actually a, a building block problem of taking, if you're working PDEs, figuring out what the PDEs uh, are, knowing that PDEs are represented by some representation here, and then building it from that. Uh, so that's part of the deal. The other part of the deal is that if you're solving a system, which didn't do that, if you're solving a system that looks like this, that you divide up into a, a series of elements just because you can, then the way of solving it is always that you can take out from this one single component and deal with that on its own. And if you're able to put together the, uh, the matrix that defines that behavior, or the, the stiffness matrix, or, or conductance matrix that defines that behavior, and you define it for a single element, then by superposition, by adding together all the components for each one of these other elements, you can put together the system equations to solve it. So that's kind of the, the big picture in what we're dealing with with the finite element stuff. Okay. So... Today, what I wanted to do is we can start out. There's lots of other things you can look at, but we don't need to deal with those. We're going to talk about um, fluid flow. It's awfully large. And I guess recap of FM is what we've already done. Um, we talked last time about ComSol applied to flow. And what I wanted to do now was deal with um, uh, one-dimensional elements in describing this behavior. Uh, so, again, this is almost premature. It's, um, let's do this slightly differently. So here's just a... I'll come back to that. Uh, here's a, a, a recap of exactly uh, what we'll do. So the first topic is really to look at fluid flow in porous media. Um, groundwater hydrologists and petroleum engineers define... Uh, system slightly differently, um, just out of uh, the historical significance of their disciplines. Groundwater hydrologists tend to talk in terms of hydraulic conductivities, uh, where hydraulic conductivity uh, is in units of meters per second of velocity, uh, which is dependent on the fluid which is flowing through it. And petroleum engineers uh, tend to talk about things in terms of permeability, which is in units of length squared, meters squared. You can actually think of the unit of permeability in meters squared as basically the diameter of a capillary tube, um, to, to at least to first order, is what this physically means. Uh, this is the viscosity of the fluid, this is the density of the fluid, and this is gravitational acceleration. And so they're linked through this. Uh, and I say that because those are there are different ways of writing the equations for those two uh, communities, if you like. And so you can always transfer backwards and forwards between them. Uh, you just need to know what the, the code is that allows you to, to be able to do that. The dependent variable... Uh, in uh, petroleum and geothermal engineering is often taken as being the fluid pressure, but in groundwater hydrology is often uh, preferred to be the hydraulic head. And hydraulic head is merely the sum of the uh, pressure head and elevation head. And it'll be apparent, I guess, from what we do. That. So this is the pressure head. Pressure divided by uh, density times gravity. This is unit weight of the fluid. And so together, 
the units of this end up being units of length and elevation is also is just the elevation of a point relative to some some datum that uh, is chosen and so again the variables that are used in groundwater hydrology versus in petroleum uh, literature are different but they're again mappable between each other and so it's useful to to be able to to remind ourselves of that we will work primarily in terms of, of this just because my notes happen to be written this way in terms of groundwater hydrology uh, uppercase k and head for the constitutive law and for the uh, dependent variable but we could equally do it in terms of permeability and fluid pressure it turns out that if you're looking at coupling mechanical problems with fluid pressures for porous media it's much more convenient to write things in terms of pressures because pressures affect deformations uh, directly and we think of that directly in terms of the linkages Tertagi's law of effective stress for instance is written in terms of pressure but you could also convert it in terms of a, a head if you so wish it's just not not so convenient and let's skip that as well and so what we need what, what we'll do is, is two things we'll um, derive the differential equations for groundwater flow first very quickly uh, just to show that we kind of have a, a feel for that and we can get to these second order PDEs that we need we'll try looking at a one-dimensional problem and try and solve it in a physical way not relying on those partial differential equations and then we'll try and cast it in a form for finite element elements and then try and solve the problem by hand uh, that way as well and so uh, the PDEs come from being able to take a, a differential cube which has lengths uh, dx, dy, this would be, d, this would be d, length dy on this axis here, width dz on this axis here. And so you can look at flow through a face on the upstream side of this and coming out on the downstream side of this separated by some small length where you have a mass rate of flow going in which is a density times a velocity so density times a velocity is we could think of being um, a mass rate superscripted dot just means rate of change of mass with with time and what we could do is just do a, a balance equation to look at the mass accumulation and so if you look at the amount of stuff that's going in on one side it's the product of density and its incremental velocity at that particular location. As it goes from one side to the other, I guess I'm, this, this would be the one here right now. It's in the x direction. As it goes across this length here, this isn't z either, it's x, isn't it? As it goes across here, it has an increment of a change in mass flow rate attached to it. So it goes in at this mass flow rate. It comes out at this mass flow rate, which is just the previous mass flow rate multiplied by a change in the mass flow rate with a distance in the x direction. And if the amount going in doesn't equal the amount coming out, then there's a certain amount that is accumulated within the element, which we have to accommodate for, right? So if it goes in at a rate, comes out at a faster rate then it's being depleted inside if it's going in um, more quickly then it's coming out then it's accumulating and so we can calculate what that accumulation is if we look at the uh, magnitudes here then we see that this term is exactly equal to this term and there's a minus sign involved and so that leaves only this one term here this left which is the mass accumulation due to flow within the x direction and if we look at doing that for the flow in the y direction and in the z direction where we use this uh, right-handed coordinate system of x y and z the so-called right-handed rule then the single component that we have for accumulation in the x direction which is here gets added to by an amount in the y direction an amount in the z direction as well and so that gives us the total amount of accumulation that can occur in this, this system. Uh, we can take some things out. Typically, we assume that uh, well, density for each of these would be the same, so that can certainly come out. And we're left with only the velocities in here, 
we can change the magnitude of this mass accumulation to represent uh, a change in a, uh, a pseudonym, um, a pseudo property of pressure. Head is proportional to pressure. And so we can uh, accommodate it by a change in head within the system. And what we can also do, as we'll see on the next slide, is if we can write the flow velocity in any of the directions as Darcy's law, which is equal to a hydraulic conductivity times a change in head in the, in this case, yes, I'm going to keep on writing in the x direction. It would actually be this term here, wouldn't it? Then we can substitute for this term here with this. This says, this is our constitutive law. It says that if we have a gradient of head, then it will cause a flow rate. The negative sign is because water flows from high potential to low potential. And the direction of flow, so if you drew a graph, I suppose, not I suppose, if you drew a graph of distance versus head, and you drew, for instance, you think of that kind of as a water table, then the gradient of head in this particular case, dh dx, would cause a flow in this direction. This is the positive x direction, but this is a negative gradient, right? A positive gradient in this space would be like this, plus Ve. This is negative. And so merely to convert um, a negative gradient, a parameter which is always positive, into a flow velocity which is intrinsically positive, this negative sign occurs. So just, it's just out of convention. And if you follow this here and substitute that, then you end up, if you substitute this expression here for each of these velocities, then what comes out of it is a partial differential equation which looks like this, uh, which says that we have a dependent variable, which occurs on both sides of the equation, here and here. This side of the equation deals with the flow in space, if you like, and this deals with capacitance. The physical statement really is mass in versus mass out equals accumulation. And all we're doing that instead of writing mass in versus mass out terms, we're writing them in terms of a local uh, gradient of head within the system. So nothing more than that. And so if we wanted to, we could reduce this equation in a number of different ways. You can see at the bottom of the page, uh, we could take it and we could write it like this, where this term here is just an abridged form of this. And the other terms follow as well. If we wanted to write it in only uh, two dimensions, then we this is we just get rid of the third dimension. So, for instance, if we're looking at flow in two dimensions instead of three dimensions, then we can look at these two little cameos. So, in this case, two dimensions would be x and y in the horizontal plane, and we could solve. We don't care about the the change in head in the vertical direction in that particular case, and in some cases. We might be interested in solving problems for flow in a two-dimensional geometry, which is a vertical slice rather than the horizontal slice. And in, in those cases, all we do is we just make sure that there's basically, not basically, bad use of English, that there's no flow in the VZ direction in any of these. And if there's no flow in the VZ direction, then by definition, hydraulic conductivity times the gradient of head in the z direction, if this is equal to zero, then by definition, since this we think of this, if this goes in this direction as being uh, a constant, a non-zero, then by definition the head in the, that direction has to be zero. And so as we go in the z direction along this length, or in the z direction up and down here, by definition the gradients are going to be zero, and if the gradients are going to be zero here, then this whole term just drops out. Hence, when we get to the bottom of this page, that term is, is missing. So just throw it away for that, that reason. So those are the, the PDE expressions. Um, I didn't perhaps do a very good job of defining the, uh, the variables before, but we talked about um, head being our variable, which is equal to 
hydraulic head being equal to uh, the pressure head plus elevation. This here is unit weight, which is just density of the fluid times gravity. And by definition, physically, this total head is if you look at the system that you'd use to measure permeability in the lab, is that if you look at uh, the elevation of some upstream point, say at the bottom of this little piezometer tube, so you take a cylinder, you fill it with sand, uh, you flow water through it from top to bottom, uh, you measure the elevation that water will rise in a piezometer at two points within it, then the head at each of these points is the sum of the elevation of the point where you're measuring the the pressure and the pressure head above it which is just the height. This height here is equal to P1 over rho. So this height plus Z1 plus P1 over gamma, yeah gamma not rho, right, is equal to this term and likewise downstream. So it's just a, an easy way for us to, to be able to find it. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I think the hydraulic height is equal to the pressure height plus the, the elevation height and the uh, velocity height, right? So we just ignore the, the velocity height. Hydro hydraulic head in, um, in groundwater hydrology does include that last term, but it's always uh, so small that it's uh, negligible. So, uh, good question. So the other part... Yeah, I, the, I, the definition in hydrology always just includes the two. And certainly in fluid mechanics, it includes all three. Because V squared over 2G is no, non natural the groundwater hydrology, we do have the seepage. Yeah, okay, so this, this is not zero, but it's small. So if you look at the magnitudes of these terms, uh, in terms of what these magnitudes might be, uh, then the changes of these uh, will be uh, small. So for instance, if you look at flow within um, a tube, it's probably not the best. And if you look at the change in pressure that occurs along that tube, which is driving flow, so this is pressure versus length, then the pressure gradient will change as you go from one location to another. We're always interested in working with the change in head with location, so it's changes. So the pressure changes from upstream to downstream. Um, if it's inclined, then the elevation head might change from upstream to downstream. What's the change in velocity as you go from upstream to downstream in this tube? Well, no, no it's it. So, it's, in this case, the change in velocity is zero, and so we can ignore it. So, I guess uh, there are two things. One is that the the velocities are typically small, so we don't have to to deal with them. And the second one is that their changes. Because the, their absolute magnitudes are small, then their changes can only be very small as well. So, uh, and so, in this particular case, yeah, the, the velocity head wouldn't would be di would not change from upstream to downstream, and so it's typically ignored. There are some cases where it is important. I mean, this term basically. So, dialing this back as well is if you look at Bernoulli's equation and think about what these terms are, then this basically represents F equals MA. This is Newton's second law. And uh, these terms represent changes in forces in the system, and this represents a change in inertia. So the reason the velocity uh, head doesn't change in this particular case is because it's going through the same um, cross-section, it's flowing at the same velocity, if it's flowing at the same velocity, then by definition there is no acceleration. So the acceleration term is zero. So that's the, the, the rationale for it. And so anyway. So we've gone to this length of um, defining uh, the PDE, and we'll use this PDE later. Uh, we've said also that if we look at um, writing things in terms of um, fluid pressures, we could probably write this PDE in a, an analogous way as d2p dx squared equals um, compressibility um, multiplied by a change in pressure with time, depending on our definition of this as compressibility or reciprocal compressibility. 
And so th that is the system that we're going to attempt to, to solve. Okay. So having, let's see, what do I do? Yeah, all right. So having done that, having derived the PD, I said that we're going to try and introduce this, uh, these physical properties in terms of the most physically based explanation we can. And so what we could do is we could think of exactly the same system as we had before. Uh, we could think of an element where we describe that element by being a, a block, which is this block. Imagine this as a, as a brick, if you like in terms of shape. It flows in through injecting in one direction here, and it comes out at the other end. It's not very dissimilar. It's quite similar, actually, to this, right? It's exactly the same as this. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to try and define it in terms of an upstream condition here and a downstream condition here. In this case, for sure, we know that since the, the head upstream versus downstream is higher upstream than downstream. We know for sure that the, the flow will be from left to right and slightly downward in this particular case. Um, we've defined the flow directions in here, um, but clearly the direction of flow would be from high potential to low potential. This is the total height relative to some datum, likewise here. And this is divided between a portion, which I presume, um, if we took this here and just dashed this across, this would be uh, P over gamma, and this would be Z, 2 in this particular case. And so what we could do is we could write Darcy's Law. Darcy's Law just says that flow rate is equal to a hydraulic conductivity times a change in head with location. We could write that as a finite derivative as h2 <coughs> minus, oh, I can't go out there, as k times h2 minus h1 over uh, delta x in this particular case. And if we do that, uh, this would give us a, uh, I guess we should multiply by cross-sectional area, I guess, in this particular case. So in other words, if, you, if we write Darcy's law in the form velocity is equal to hydraulic conductivity change in head with length minus, then flow rate Q is equal to area times velocity. And so that's all this is. And what we could do is we could write it in terms of Q1 being equal to a change in head from uh, the upstream to the downstream, H2 minus H1, in terms of how we've defined this. And it occurs over some length of this element, which is just this length. And so this is just a statement of Darcy's law, which has been written for our particular case. The one thing that we've assumed in this is that we're not treating this as a vectoral quantity. So we're treating this as a magnitude which is positive or negative depending on whether it's flowing in or out of the system. Just as a convenience. We can do that. We can do whatever we like, of course. Uh, and so in other words, we're defining the amount of flow that goes through the system. If we know that this system is a steady state, then by definition, the definition of steady state means that it's not changing in time. And so that physically also means that there's no fluid that's accumulating in this cell. And so if there's no fluid that's accumulating in this cell, then the amount that flows out has to be exactly the same that is flowing in. And so we could write that in terms of this. And this is slightly different from how we write this typically in mechanics. If, if uh, it was a vectoral quantity, we'd probably write V1 is equal to V2, right? So this, if we had a velocity out of here, a velocity by definition has both magnitude and direction. And so this would have a magnitude, whatever it is, but also a direction. This velocity 
would also have a magnitude and direction, and by definition they'd be the same, because the directions are the same and the magnitudes are the same. What we're doing that's different in our convenient definition of flow rate into the element is that we're taking it as being positive if it's out of the element and negative if it's into the element. So in other words, the signs of these gets changed and therefore conforms to this. So if we take this as being true, then we can write Q2 as being the negative of this, by definition. And so now we have two equations, one for Q1 and Q2, and we can write them stacked on top of each other, exactly the same way. And if we do that, by taking this vector out of here, we end up with um, two flow rates defined at each end of the element, two heads defined at each end of the element, and a matrix that links them in some way. And so this is exactly the, the behavior that we've talked about in terms of a conductance matrix, which links dependent variable of head with a, an impact, which is the flow rate that comes out of it. And so we haven't had to resort to doing anything fancy with the partial diff PDE. We've immediately just driven it, uh, derived it based on heuristics, I suppose. And so that's useful, I think. So that gives us the ability to straight away, without doing anything else, figure out exactly what this conductance matrix is. This, this is what we'll call the conductance matrix. matrix. And the, the important thing for this is that this conductance matrix will always be the same for this particular element. And it comprises the area of flow. So the cross-section area of flow, if I drew out this little prism properly, or if it was a, a cylindrical thing, the cross-sectional area of flow is this. So this is A. The hydraulic conductivity of this is K. And the length over which this flows is just L. This happens to be for element number one. Uh, and so uh, in this case, we've used Roman numerals for each of these elements. So this would be K1, A1, and L1. So that's just the template that we have for that element. If we wanted to now solve a system that had a whole bunch of different materials in it, then we could just put them together in a, a linear sequence. And if we know what the conductance matrix is for each one of these elements, then we have enough information to be able to put the, the system together. Nothing more than that. And so the key is to be able to, to know that this is our conductance matrix. I won't flip back in the notes to show it, but you'll also remember you may also remember that we talked about for a second order PDE, which this is, that this conductance matrix would always look like uh, an integral of a different matrix, its transpose, a constitutive matrix, which would be Darcy's law, and the same element matrix integrated over the volume of the element. This matrix here is exactly that, but we've had to do none of this to be able to get to it. And so I think that's a, a useful first step. So that's that's where we are. So let's do so the you know one one watchword I think for this class is that we always try and when we can try and derive things in a physical sense, and then try and illustrate them with a very simple one-dimensional example just to examine some behaviors. And so we've done the the physical uh, derivation. Let's apply it to a problem. And so this is the problem that we want to, to solve, very straightforwardly. And so we could think of a, a dam. A dam that uh, has two materials inside it and impound, impounds some water upstream and keeps it separate from downstream. To make life easy for us, um, these water levels will be above the, um, the flowing part of the dam. And so this upper material here is impermeable, so it's really a bit like a, a pipe that goes through here, that's sandwiched between two different uh, layers. But the upstream layer 
has twice the hydraulic conductivity, sorry, the up upstream compartment has twice the hydraulic conductivity of the downstream part. And so one way to represent that is just by using two elements. You could debate or you could think as to whether it would be better if instead of dividing it into one element upstream and one element downstream, that we might want to do it into multiple elements. And you might you should you'd probably come to the conclusion that that buys you actually nothing, it makes it more complicated, but it doesn't buy you any additional accuracy. And so I'll get rid of those. And so our transformation then between the geometry of this and the, the finite element geometry would be two elements, a downstream element, which is this, which we'll use Roman 1 for, an upstream element, which we'll use Roman 2 for. Um, we have some geometries on this. This is 10 meters uh, high, so this dimension here would also be uh, 10 meters. If we drew it in perspective, then I guess this it's a really a prismatic block that we're drawing. If I can draw this. And then this, we can choose any arbitrary width that we want. It's probably going to be worthwhile choosing it one meter in width, just unit width into the, the page. And if that's the case, then this cross-sectional area here for both of these, these elements, A1 in this particular case, is this. It's the same for both, right? 10 high, 1 across. Hydraulic conductivities are given for this here and this for the upstream part. And the length of individual elements are 10 meters. That's, that's the information that completely describes our system. And so what we can do is we can use this template to be able to take each one of these elements, which are basically the same, and it will be defined by some length of the element, which is L, some cross-sectional area, which is A, some hydraulic conductivity, which is K, and we know that we can always get the conductance matrix for that, which is just given by this, nothing more. And that's for one element. And so if we can apply this element for this portion here, then we can figure out exactly what this, the numbers that go into here are. We know area, we know conductivity, and we know length. And so for element number one, we can get that. And for element number two, we can also get that. So here we go. So this is the deal. If we throw some numbers into this, see if I can keep, I don't think I can keep both on the thing at the same time. It's not the right geometry. No, it's not. So I will do this. Uh, what will I do? I will do that the conductance matrix is equal to the cross-sectional area, the hydraulic conductivity, the length of the element, plus this template matrix. Happens to be this. We know uh, that this will be true for element number one, where these are values Roman one throughout. And so if we go ahead and do that, and we take that, so it's 10 by 10 to the six, 10 to the minus 6 divided by 10. So I guess 10 divided by 10 is 1. So this is just 10 to the minus 6 times this template. And that's this term here. If we do it for element number 2, then the only thing that's different is that we know that the conductivity of this is twice as large. And so the only thing that's going to change is that when we apply it to that, then this term here replaces this term. Everything else is going to be the same. And so then we want to be able to solve the system which involves this particular representation. So in the same way that we've defined that um, when we describe this matrix, this is defining the fact that, let me back up to this. The other thing that we'll also do, which I didn't explain, so we define the individual matrices for the elements, but we also have to define nodes. And so the nodes 
that communicate with each other between the adjacent elements are nodes 1, 2, and 3. And we notice that nodes 1 and 2 are present in the first element, and nodes 2 and 3 are present in the second element. And so what we could do is we could uh, write out the matrices that define this as in terms of these two elements here, Q1 and Q2. We know are linked with this overall conductance matrix. So I'll underline it to represent the fact that it's a matrix. And this is a matrix underscore. And it, we know exactly what it is. It's a 2 by 2 matrix. But this links magnitudes of heads at nodes 1 and heads at nodes 2 to those fluxes. So that's the first part. For this matrix, the, head, the flux at node 2 and the flux at node 3 are going to be linked by this conductance matrix, Roman 2, underlined, to heads 2 oops, and head 3. And so those are completely separate for now. But what we'd like to do is be able to combine them in some useful way. And so it turns out that the way that we combine them is just by taking this form of the expression that we've just written out here. I'll underline this because it's a matrix and that this is a vector, right? This is a, a two by one vector. So this expression is true at the element level. It's written here, and it's written here. But if we want to write it for the whole system, then all we have to do is we have to just add all the processes together. We sum all the components. And if we sum all the components, what we're going to do is we're going to end up with a ve vector that includes not just h1 and h2, but also includes h3, head at 3. And so that's this next step. And it's actually very uh, method methodological. It's straightforward. It's basically accounting. Uh, this would be a great job for an accountant to do. And so if you look at this matrix now, so we have flow rates at nodes 1, at nodes 2, and nodes 3. Ignore everything else. This is a vector that joins these all together. We have heads at nodes 1, 2, and 3. We know that to link heads and fluxes, if this is a 3 by 1 vector, three rows, RC, um, three rows, one column. This is a three by one vector, three rows, row, 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 uh, one column. Then to link those, we need a, a three by three matrix, just from matrix algebra. So we know that we have three fluxes, we know we have three heads. We don't know any of the fluxes, except for one. We do know that the upstream head in our system at node uh, 3 is 25 meters. And we know that the downstream head at node 1 is 20 meters. So these are the parameters we have. And we don't know what this is. That's what we'd like to find out. That's the essence of the problem we're trying to solve. At every single node in our element, we'll either know one head or we would know the, the flux. We never know on the boundary both of them. We want to solve for the other one. Um, and so really what we're after, we'd like to know what this flux is, which we don't know. We'd like to know what this flux is, which we don't know. We kind of know Q2. We know Q2 because we know that the amount that's flowing out of element 1 into element 2, they have to be equal to each other. And so uh, we can show it later, but you should take on trust that for any internal node, the net flux has to be zero because the same amount is flowing out from one element is flowing into the other element. And by definition from our sign convention, our sign convention was that the flow rates are positive if going out of an element and negative if going out into an element. So they cancel from each other. So that's the one thing. So, so far we know we have three parameters here. We have three parameters here. We know some of them. Uh, 
but we also know that they have to be linked by some matrix which includes a 3 by 3 matrix. So we could draw enough spots to be able to fit a 3 by 3 matrix with nine components. We know that in this, and let me do this, let me do it for this one here because it's a bit more challenging. Let me write it so that I can show both at the same time. So I'll write it down at the bottom. So we know that Q2 and Q3 are related to hydraulic conductivity, area, and length. And this is a 2 by 1 vector. This is a 2 by 1 vector also. By the way, if you understand what we do today, absolutely, you will know everything you ever need to know about fine elements. Uh, so it's actually a, a pretty straightforward process, I think. And this is this index matrix which links it. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to identify the fact that this, because this is 2 and this is 3, that this relates to node number 2, and this column here relates to node number 3. And likewise, this row here relates to number 2, and this row here relates to number 3. So going down here, these relate to this, because it's multiplied by H2 to give us this component of the flux. This H3 is multiplied by this to give us the component of the flux, etc. And so with this indexing, what we could do is we could write nodes 1, 2, and 3. We could also write this at the top of this term here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this one first. I'll just make this slightly smaller. So this is the conductance matrix that links Q2 and Q3. So in other words, this term and this term. It links them to heads 2 and heads 3, this term and this term. And therefore, this matrix would go in exactly to these two positions here. Right. 2 and 3, 2 and 3, 2 and 3. I didn't do it here. Sorry. 1, 2, and 3. And so the components for this term here, uh, it's this term here, the 10 to the 6 is outside. So this 2, minus 2, minus 2, 2 is basically from this expression here. That's the first part. So we've taken care of this component in our sum. We want to add the terms in that represent the nodes numbers 1 and 2. And so in this term, this would be 1. This would be 2. This was 2 and 3, right? And so in this particular case, throwing, following exactly the same logic, we take this template here, and it would go in to this point here. Right? Plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, and then plus 1 goes here. And so as a result of that, we have the conductance matrix <coughs> assembled, if you like, from the individual components of the, um, uh, of the element matrix, matrices. And then we have to, to solve that system of equations. So we have to think about what we know. We know the heads that are upstream, which is H3. We know the head which is downstream, which is H1. And we also know from the argument we mentioned before that Q2 has to be zero because this, the amount of fluid flowing out of element one into element number two cancel each other exactly. Um, yes, okay. So what does that mean? It means now for this system, we're actually left only with this. The reason for these horizontal lines is that we only have one unknown left in our system. And therefore, we only have one equation needed to solve it. The one unknown is the head at this intermediate point. We don't know what the head here is. That's our question. We know what the flux is. Q1, Q2 in versus Q2 out is 
cancel each other. And so we're solving for that. So basically, we could take this expression here. I know it's getting a bit muddled, maybe on the board. But if we write it out in longhand, Q2 is equal to um, that what have I done? Yeah, OK. So I could do it. Um, I could. So if I write out the central equation in longhand, it is Q2 is equal to 10 to the minus 6 multiplied by minus 1 times h1 plus 3 times h2, this term here, minus 2 times h3. Yeah, I guess that's it, right? So I'm just writing out this equation. h1 times minus 1, h2 times plus 3, h3 times minus 2, which is this. And so the only one that we're interested in in this is this central one, because we know the other one. So we'll keep that. And we'll just shift both of these off to the other side by subtracting them. Nothing more than that. And so that's this. So q2 is here. We know it's 0. Um, oh, yes. OK, I see. So um, 2 times 25 times 10 to the minus 6 is here. 1 times 20 times 10 to the minus 6 is here. So this is this term. So this term here is this. This term here is this. And we're left with this one remaining component. And so if we work out what these are, we realize that, that you get rid of the 10 to the 6s because we don't need them. And if you solve it, you end up with the magnitude at h2 is equal to um, 70 over 3 uh, as a fraction. And so now what we can do, probably you're interested not in really, it's a bit of an esoteric calculation. We're not all that interested to find out what this head is, but you might be interested to know how much stuff is going through this dam. That might be the question that you're asking. And we don't know that yet. But we do, because now what we have is we have a matrix where now we know that this is equal to 70 divided by 3. We know everything on the right-hand side. We know everything in this matrix. And so by definition, we know everything on the left-hand side, too. And so if we resubstitute the term in for head 2, we can calculate just by resubstituting into this matrix exactly what Q1 is, which is minus 3.33. Uh, so it's actually uh, 10 over 3 times 10 to the minus 6. You could actually do it uh, algebraically without uh, the decimals, I guess. It's 10 over, yeah, 10 over 3. And this magnitude is negative. It's coming out of the, the bottom of the dam. And this magnitude is positive, which is going into the top or vice versa. And so this just represents the fact that the these are not flow rates, they're magnitudes either in or out of the system as, as scalar quantities, not vectoral quantities. And that's the, the solution to the problem. And so that uh, is really the essence of, uh, of, of finite element uh, analysis. Um, I guess we could think about exactly whether that makes sense. Um, we do have a little bit of time. Um, I'm trying to think. So, well, let's, let's do that. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Let's do it on here. Yeah, why not? So does it make sense is the question. So we don't need that part here. And I guess I can make it white on gold. So remember, so we basically had a so the question is, so you should never, I guess there's another um, general advice question, uh, recommendation to you or suggestion. Never trust a computer code, ever. Because you need to be able to make the case that you understand what's going on. And so we'll talk about validation and verification. But for now, uh, what we have was that the Upstream head was equal to 25 meters, right? 
the downstream head was equal to 20. Um, the flow rate in was equal to, I think, 10 over 3. It was 3.33, right, which is 10 over 3 times 10 to the minus 6 cubic meters per second. And by definition, it was the same amount coming out of the bottom side. And so the question is whether this value, uh, certainly if k1 and k2 were the same as each other, what would you expect the pressure profile to be uh, at this intermediate point? Not much of a question because I've kind of answered it. Right? And how can you rationalize that? Well, Darcy's law says that Flow velocity is equal to hydraulic conductivity times a gradient, <coughs> minus sign. So if we are at steady state, then by definition, um, this is Roman 1, right? So the velocity in element 1 and the velocity in element 2 should be the same, right? by definition. So if that's the case, then V1 has to equal, that's a V2. And this would be 1. And this would have to equal minus K2 dh dx. So because these are the same, this is basically all I've written out here is right that, that v1 is equal to v2. That's just writing Darcy's law for each case. So by definition, if the hydraulic conductivities were the same because of this requirement here in steady state that we're not accumulating, by definition the gradients in element 1 and element 2 have to be the same, which is just this. This is dh, this is dx. And so the only way that we can satisfy that is that if this is a straight line between the upstream boundary condition and the downstream boundary condition. And if that was the case, then this intermediate one would be 22.5, which is in terms of thirds, um, what is yeah? What is that in terms of thirds? Someone who's better at math than me. So that would be 60, 60. Actually, doesn't it's not a, a direct. Um, doesn't drive. No, forget it. You can't do it directly, right? Because it's a factor of three. But in our particular case, what did we have? We had that the the magnitude of this head instead of being uh, that was this, and this was uh, 70 over 3. And so I suppose what we could do uh, is we would know that uh, if we take the downstream portion and we look at it, what is the gradient? And if we look at the upstream portion, what are the gradients on each of those? This is 10 meters. This is 10 meters. Uh, the change in head from here, so 20 is um, 60 over 3. So I guess this is 10 over 3. And I suppose going from 60 over 3 to... Is that right? Oh, yes, yeah, right, so to 75. So this is uh, 75 over 3. This is 60 over 3. So 70 over 3 to 75 over 3 is 5 thirds. And so in other words, the gradient on this is ha uh, twice as large as the gradient here. And the reason for this is it's just conforming to this. This, in our case, was equal to 1. 
times 10 to the 6. This was equal to 2. And therefore, for these to be equal to each other, then this has to be um, 2 and 1. So in other words, the gradient here has to be a factor of 2 different from each other to be able to do it. So it makes perfect sense. So you can rationalize it. And so everything that you do, you could do that calculation very simply. And of course, you could do the, this, the other calculation to figure out what the intermediate head should be in your system uh, even more simply, right? This should be 22 and a half. Uh, multiplied by 3, which is not a whole number, so I'll avoid it. But validation and verification of exactly what these are is, is a useful thing to do. So um, I think if I do that, we go back to where we were. So don't uh, trust a code ever. If you can't validate or verify a, a very simple uh, geometry to be able to show exactly what it's doing, then it probably isn't doing what it's doing, and you should never never uh, skip that step. But here we know it's doing uh, what it should be. For instance, the easiest way to validate this calculation would be just to take um, a two-element example that has the same connectivity in each part, I would say. Uh, you can absolutely, on the back of the envelope, calculate exactly what the flow rate through that should be just by using Darcy's Law. If you know that it's homogeneous, you know from our previous discussion that the gradient has to be constant, and then you can absolutely use this calculation to do that. And so you'd be able to figure out exactly what the flow rate is, and uh, you could check it for the homogeneous case. Uh, you can check that your solution gives you the right head at this intermediate part. It should be uniform, and so it should be the same. Uh, and then once you've done that, you could go back and you could change this to multiply it by a factor of 2, and then you get a different result. You know from what we've just said about the uh, gradients in each part, you could check that the magnitude of the head at this intermediate point conforms to what you think it is. And now you can answer that question that we uh, deferred, if you like, and that is if you take this geometry, oops, if this is the geometry, I'm not sure what I'm doing quite wrong here, is if you take this geometry that has two elements in it for these two different materials, and you have nodes 1, 2, and 3, do you buy yourself anything by solving it with four elements and therefore five nodes, which would give you five equations to solve? <coughs> so in our case, Three equations, because of our boundary conditions, top and bottom reduced to one equation. If you're solving it with five nodes and four elements, you'd have five equations. You'd be able to throw away the upstream equation and the downstream equation, but you'd still have the three equations for the intermediate. So you wouldn't be able to solve it algebraically very simple. simply. You'd have to solve it by solving simultaneous equations. So the question is, do you get anything out of extra by solving by having extra elements in it. Anyone going to be brave? We're all friends here. We don't shout at people if they get the answer wrong. We celebrate them. And the answer is really here, right? If we said that irrespective of the materials, whether it's the same material in both places or different materials, the gradient in each of these places, we could argue based on Darcy's law, has to be constant. Then by adding an extra intermediate element, it would actually just give you this same measured magnitude, or calculated magnitude of uh, uniform value. So in this case, you'd get absolutely no benefit whatsoever uh, from using two elements to represent this single element because it would just give you this linear behavior. If, however, the gradient in this physical system was going to be curved for some reason, then to get this curved shape, uh, you would actually benefit from having a second element because it would give you a more accurate solution. <coughs>
So th the main point is that in this case, we used the simplest way to divide it into two elements. Each of those two elements had a uniform gradient on it, a linear variation head. And by dividing them up into sub-elements, uh, it wouldn't have bought us anything uh, in terms of accuracy. But it would cost, of, cost us a lot because instead of dealing with three equations, we'd be dealing with five. Instead of throwing away two of the equations, we'd again throw two and be left with three equations to solve rather than just one equation in this particular case. Just so. So, final elements, we take a template, we define a conductance matrix that says something about that template. Uh, that conductance matrix will be different for this two-node two element than it will be for a two-dimensional element that includes, we've done two seconds, two-dimensional element that includes um, uh, three nodes rather than two. And so I think what we'll do next time is we'll talk about um, two-dimensional elements. And so the only negative thing about that is that there is no way to derive the equations for two-dimensional elements except for going back to the PDEs. And so that's we have the PDEs already today. There isn't a nice, simple, intuitive description of how you can get it from just looking at Darcy's Law, which is what we did here, but a slightly more involved way of doing it. But we'll end up with exactly the same conductance matrix that we haven't proved that we need yet, but we will need it to look at triangular elements. So that's it. Okay, great. Thank you. Any questions? You should ask questions as they come up.